welcome everybody to uh, today's seminar on anthropology, forensics, and the scientific method. My name is Mark Dobbs, instructor here at uh, City College for a number of years now, a few years, uh, two or three, you lose track. Very elegant. What? You look very elegant. <laughs> you just you you couldn't keep it in, could you? <laughs> you couldn't keep it in. Well, that's okay. That's an extra five points for you. So, <laughs> so as you can see, some of my students are here. Um, so. Um, what I'll do is I, I will explain kind of how to get into this and how I got into it and, and, and what it's about and so on. But uh, I'll do that kind of as, as we go along. Um, but just kind of in, to introduce the topic. And by the way, just like Dr. Toby said, um, we are going to talk about real things. And I'm going to show you some real things. And some of the things I'm going to show you may not be you know, uh, the most pleasant things you've seen. I did save some of the real uh, graphic stuff for another time, but I do have some things in here that um, just to be aware. But this is reality, and this is what I tell my students. When um, oftentimes I'll show, I'll uh, show, uh, when we talk about forensics in my class, and I'll show uh, a video, and my students will go, you, uh, you, and um, I, I say, this is real. This is life. And uh, these things that we're talking about, as you're going to find out, uh, biology, anthropology, it's not just academic, it's, uh, it's applied as well, and applied in some pretty important areas of life, and so this happens to be one of them. But for those of you who aren't uh, aware of what anthropology is and, and, and what anthropologists do, um, you're, you're not alone. My family wonders the same thing, and so I have to keep reminding them. But uh, basically, anthropology is the field of inquiry that uh, studies human culture and evolutionary aspects of human biology. That doesn't say very much, but it means a lot. So there's lots of stuff in anthropology. My students will tell you I give the whole spiel about all the different things that anthropology covers. So we don't have time to get into all that today. But uh, suffice it to say that if you haven't taken an anthro class, whether it be biological anthropology here or we also have great cultural classes in the uh, behavioral sciences uh, area, um, if you haven't had an opportunity to do that, uh, I recommend you do. This is fun, good, fun stuff. Physical or biological anthropology, which is kind of what we're thinking about here, is the study of human biology within the framework of evolution, with an emphasis on the interaction between biology and culture. One, one of the things that's unique about humans is we cannot separate uh, our cultural aspect from a biological aspect. They both go together. They both influence each other. They've done so for millions of years. And so uh, we take those things, as an anthropologist, we take those things into consideration, including in forensics. There, there are, you know, there's a lot of things you can tell from the skeleton about the way people lived, and so we, we look at those things as well. Well, we also adhere to the principles of the scientific method, and my students hopefully will be able to tell you a bit about the scientific method. Um, but the scientific method is a research method whereby a problem is identified. Okay, so anybody in my class need help with a research question for the paper? A problem is identified, a hypothesis is stated, and, a, um, and the hypothesis is tested through the collection and analysis of data. That data has to be observable. Okay? It has to be able to be observed using the senses, the natural senses. It has to be empirical. Empirical comes from the Latin empiricus, which means experience. Experience. We gather data through our own experience. Um, and it has to be measurable. We humans love and love and love to put numbers on things. We, 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 something isn't real to us unless we can put some sort of number on it oftentimes. And so we have to be able to measure things, quantify things, qualify things, uh, that type of thing. So in the scientific method, we do all of those things. Then once we have gathered our data, tested it, tested our hypothesis, then we can either verify that hypothesis and turn it into a theory, which is something that is at least in part uh, verified, or we have to scrap it and kind of start over. But that's the fun of science is trying to get to the end of a problem, the end of a question. And that's something that uh, I do in forensics all the time and in other aspects of my work, too. OK, so just to give you an example of some of the things that anthropologists are interested in, in, uh, in asking, some of our research questions. Now, there's thousands of them. They never end. But just to give you an example of the broad scope of what an anthropologist is going to look at, uh, when and why did the first human ancestors become bipedal, right? walking on two legs? When did that happen? about four million years ago, maybe even more. Uh, next semester, we'll see if uh, we can change that number in our book there. But probably at least four million years ago. Um, what accounts for the differences in behavior between cultural groups? We want to ask that kind of thing as an anthropologist. And why are we as a species so dependent on uh, spoken language, uh, symbolic verbal communication? 
And you can go even more broad and say what led, what factors led to the development of large state level societies, civilization, things like that. So within anthropology, and this is why I, I encourage people to explore it a little bit, you can ask a lot of questions and you can study a lot of things. If it has to do, I tell my class, if it has to do with humans, uh, you can look at it from an anthropological perspective. Okay? Now, forensic anthropology, this is why we're here. Okay. Forensic anthropology is an applied anthropological approach dealing with legal matters. That's what forensic means, to give evidence. We use anthropological theory and methods to work with coroners, medical examiners, and other law enforcement uh, individuals in the identification and analysis of human remains. Uh, forensic anthropology kind of began as a discipline uh, in the early 1900s, early part of the uh, uh, 20th century, when uh, coroners, medical examiners throughout the country would happen upon these cases where they have basically just skeletal remains. They just have bones. And um, they didn't know what to do with the bones and how to uh, you know, identify the individuals. People aren't used to that. Forensic pathologists to this day aren't that used to dealing with such things. And so they go to people like myself. But um, uh, so wh what do you do if you have a question? If you don't know how to solve a crime problem, it, you know, back then, what did you do? Well, you do what everybody does. You go to the FBI, package the bones up, put them in a box. Send them to the FBI, and the FBI opens the box and says, wow, bones, what do we do? What do we do? Hmm, let me think, what do we do? Well, this time, at, at this point, the early part of the FBI's history, they were housed in a building across the street from the Natural History Museum. And, uh, well, there's lots of bones there. Maybe we can go over there and ask somebody what they think of these bones. If they can identify, is it human, is it not human, is it uh, male, female, what's going on here? How can we get an answer to this question? There's lots of bones over there. Well, it turns out in the anthropology department of the uh, Smithsonian and the Museum of Natural History and places like that, academics for a long time were asking these questions. What can you tell? How can you recreate the biology, behavior, circumstances of individuals based on their skeletal remains? Because from an archaeological standpoint or a paleoanthropological standpoint where you're looking at fossil humans, um, you oftentimes that's all you have is the, the remains of the individuals, the bones themselves. So lots of studies were undertaken to see, okay, just how much information, how much data can we gather from these bones uh, in order to reconstruct life ways of, of people. Turns out that this is something that's very, very handy um, for, uh, for society as a whole today. And it's one of those ways that anthropology can be applied to larger problems in, in the world. Um, now, uh, forensic anthropologists do a number of things. We, you know, usually we get called in uh, when you have skeletal remains. Sometimes we get called in when the remains aren't so skeletal. Um, but, uh, but the information that's going to be helpful needs to be gleaned from the skeleton. And so there, there are a number of ways to do that. But the types of information we're looking for, uh, first of all, is it human or non-human? Okay, well, we're going to talk about each of these things in turn. But is it human or non-human? Um, is it forensic or non-forensic? Meaning, is it, do we have a legal problem here? Do we have somebody modern who, who is deceased who needs to be dealt with? Or do we have maybe a Paleo-Indian, somebody much older, or maybe not even a Paleo-Indian, but somebody from 100, 150 years ago? In which case, it's not really forensic anymore. It might be a homicide case, but there's nothing anybody can do about it. The uh, responsible parties aren't living anymore, and so you move on. We'll talk about that. Um, we determine sex. Okay. If you're going to try to identify somebody, obviously sex is going to be the, one of the primary determinants of, of a person's identity. Um, and it's also, you know, a person's identity is going to be the jumping off point for any kind of investigation, uh, if it's a homicide or an accident or whatever it might be. Biological ancestry, uh, most of you probably know this is race. We'll talk about this uh, when, when we get to it. Um, but we want to be able to uh, give an idea of where the person, uh, the population that the person came from. Okay. What population did they come from? What is their ancestry? You can re reconstruct stature. You're looking for somebody between 5'9 and 6'2, something like that, uh, just to round down the uh, missing uh, person's inquiries. Lori and I spend a lot of time looking at these missing persons' issues. And one of the things that uh, surprises us, and it may or may not surprise you, but there's thousands of people missing out there, thousands and thousands of people missing. And uh, you need to be able to round down, give yourself some parameters to try to find out that the person, you know, try to make the match between the missing person and the John or Jane Doe that you're dealing with. So, um, biological ancestry, stature, and then, of course, also trauma. Trauma is very important. Is this hole supposed to be there or is it not supposed to be there? 
Okay, so why would anybody want to do this type of work? And uh, so when you come into the, to your office one day and this is what's facing you, why would you want to do that? Ultimately speaking, I'm going to answer this question at the end. Okay? But perhaps the reaction that you have to this type of thing is the same reaction that I had before I got into this. And this is, this is the point at which I'll tell you kind of how I got into it and, and why I do it. Um, when I first took my, took my first biological anthropology class and they talked about forensics, my reaction was, ew, yuck, and why would anybody, and how could you, and can't we just move on and talk about monkeys or something fun like that? Well, I got into uh, archaeology uh, quite a bit, and in archaeology, you know, you have to, uh, you do a lot of examination of uh, material remains of civilizations and groups. You also do a lot of uh, examination of their biological remains. There's a lot of information to be uh, retrieved from, from the skeleton. And that started to fascinate me. And then I started to take human osteology courses. And osteology is a study of, of the skeleton. So I started to take human osteology courses and anatomy courses and uh, biology courses. And then I started to take criminal investigations courses and other law, uh, the criminal justice courses. And I just, it, I just, it just grew on me. It just grew on me. And it became kind of a fascinating thing to try to solve a mystery, try to be part of solving a mystery, try to start with nothing and, and end up with information. And that's a very good scientific uh, point of view, I think. That's, what, that's why we do research in science. You have a question and you want to answer it. For forensic anthropologists, the question oftentimes is, um, you know, who is this person? How did they die? Does somebody need to be held accountable for it? Is it an accident? Is it suicide? Uh, what is it? And so, to me, it's very fascinating to start with those questions and then try to parse those things out and, and try to come up with an ultimate solution, uh, or at least help out with an ultimate solution, right? I mean, my work ends uh, once I've identified uh, the, the characteristics of the person. You know, you watch, uh, my, my brother-in-law is uh, a uh, vice president at Fox Television, and they have that show Bones. I don't know if anyone's ever seen it. But um, he, he sent me the pilot episode to that, to that show about nine months or so before it came out. And I said, boy, you're going to love this. This is right up your street. This is what you do, and you're just going to be fantastic. And uh, I, uh, I, I, he showed it to me, and I said, wow, that's really horrible. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, hey, you know, more power to you, but I don't know of any place where I can go and I can stick a skull in a little box and push a button and have a 3D hologram of a person appear before me and know exactly what they look like. It doesn't work that way. So, but, but how do you go from this to what the person looks like. It's fascinating. It's fascinating and it's science and it's empirical. It's experience. And, and, and it's, it's more labor intensive and it's less glamorous and sexy. And like that show Bones, this is kind of where I was getting to. My, you know, my job ends one, once I say, okay, you're looking for a Caucasian male, this uh, tall, this old, about this old, you know, died of gunshot wound in the back of the head, whatever. Once I give that information and then I go back to doing whatever I was doing, I don't, you know, strap on the gun and go, you know, run down alleys and try to get bad guys. No, I'm scared of guns. I don't do that. Um, so, but at any rate, why, why, so how did I get into this? Well, I got into it because, quite frankly, it was fascinating. And I, so what I did was, when I was in grad school in Southern California, um, I got, uh, I, I volunteered or interned with the L.A. County coroner. And we also were, went to, when I, where I went to school, we, uh, uh, did a lot of curating of human remains for Orange County, LA County, Riverside County, and San Bernardino County. Lots and lots of forensic cases for us to work on, to learn from, and to experience. And so I just became very fascinated with it. Um, and uh, so now this is, this is what I do. Now if, you're going, if you want to get into this type of thing, um, you're going to, you know, you're going to want to get, if you want to be a forensic anthropologist, you're going to want to get a graduate degree in, in anthropology, biological anthropology, um, at, at minimum. And you're going to want to have a lot of experience in human osteology, being able to identify uh, different types of, uh, of skeletal remains, be they human or not. Um, so you have to have a strong background in not only biological anthropology, but also biology and anatomy. Okay? More and more and more, uh, there's formalized training in this type of thing. Uh, you can go to a lot of, like, for example, Cal State Chico has a uh, master's uh, degree program in anthropology, and you can get also go up there and get a certificate in uh, forensic identification. Um, so there are schools all across the country where you can go in, and sp specifically look at it being a forensic anthropologist. 
Now, as far as getting an actual job, there are very few jobs where they say, forensic anthrop we're hiring a forensic anthropologist. Most places, what they're going to do, coroner, medical examiner, whatever, police agency, what they're going to do is they're going to go to the local college university and they're going to have somebody come in, you know, as needed to help them with these situations. That's how most of it is done. Um, some places have, you know, state forensic anthropologists, like Mary Mannheim is the forensic anthropologist for Louisiana. Um, um, I'm trying to remember who, well, some states have, have forensic anthropologists. But uh, mostly it's not an actual job position. You're not going to find an opening. You're going to teach and you're going to get called in and you're going to uh, kind of hire or loan yourself out to do these types of things. Um, but I find that teaching and doing this type of work go hand in hand very nicely because the teaching to me informs my work as an anthropologist, forensic anthropologist. Um, it helps me because I'm working constantly with students on new problems and thinking about things. It kind of reinforces those skills. And then uh, also being a forensic anthropologist helps me to uh, have experience to convey concepts and, and situations uh, to my students. And so they, they mesh very, very well. Um, related fields, if you do want to go right into something like this, uh, coroner's investigators. That's a very uh, important and good, good job. Uh, and more and more and more, it used to be that if you wanted to be an, a coroner's investigator, in other words, you're not the person doing the autopsies, but you're the person going to the scene on behalf of the coroner, examining the body, examining the circumstances, uh, interviewing witnesses, interviewing the detectives, gathering all that data for, uh, uh, for, for on behalf of the coroner or the medical examiner. Um, it, it used to be that if you wanted to do that, you're, you needed to have a bachelor's in criminal justice or even nursing uh, some, uh, or a health-related field, something like that. But more and more and more, you're seeing or anthropology. And that, to me, is kind of a real breakthrough. The difference between coroners and medical examiners, most uh, counties in the United States employ coroners, right? And a coroner is an, usually an elected official. Uh, and that person may or may not have any medical or law enforcement training. Normally, uh, or I should say most frequently, they have training in, um, uh, in law enforcement. Um, but it is an elected position. In some counties, the coroner is, is the sheriff. Like in the county that I work in, Contra Costa, the coroner is the sheriff. Uh, more and more uh, counties, jurisdictions, states even, are employing the medical examiner system wherein they, uh, they hire a medical examiner who is a trained forensic pathologist, a doctor, an MD, who has training in, uh, in forensic pathology, which is uh, performing autopsies to determine uh, cause of death in, in a number of different situations. Um, and they tend to be medical examiners. For example, I did, um, well, I've worked with uh, San Diego County Medical Examiner and some others. The medical examiners are tend to be independent from the local law enforcement. They are their own thing. And I think San Francisco may even have a medical examiner. Well, I'm not positive. I know they have a medical examiner. I'm not sure how independent it, it may be from the rest of law enforcement here. I think it is, though. But so, so a coroner would be an elected official. Medical examiners is a separate, uh, separate from the other law enforcement agencies. It's standalone kind of responsibility is to determine cause of death uh, and, and as a public health agency to determine if there might be a public health issue, right? If you have people dying of a certain disease, medical examiners try to investigate what, uh, what might be the, uh, the underlying causes and try to address those things from a public health standpoint. But they're, they're really, they are very, very synonymous. It's just that um, coroners, the old school coroner used to be uh, an elected official and still is in a lot of places. It's, a lot of times it's the sheriff also, sheriff coroner. Um, and uh, coroner comes from the old English term crowner which basically means when you die, you have to pay your death taxes, or your family has to pay your death taxes, and the crowner is the person who comes to collect the, uh, the taxes. Um, so yes? The coroner, oh, that's a very good question. Okay, the coroner is an elected official. Uh, that's very good. I'm, thank you for bringing that up. Coroner is an elected official, but he or she hires forensic patho pathologists. So, yeah. And in fact, uh, uh, traditionally speaking throughout the country, if you have a homicide investigation, um, you ha you'll have the investigators respond to the scene and there will be the body, but nobody, none of those people can touch that body. Only the coroner can or medical examiner can. So that's, that's how the difference, the, the medical examiner and coroner or coroner handles the body and everything attached to the body and the, the uh, detectives 
the police would handle the scene. And then the coroner or medical examiner gives information via the examination and autopsy to the detectives. So yeah, so even though the a coroner is oftentimes elected, he or she will hire people who are trained in forensic pathology. Okay, so the first question is, is it human or is it not human? Okay, why might that be an important question? Yes, some people might be, but I have identified bones that were non-human, and the, 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 you know, the coroner said, you know, okay, well, what do we do now? And another person would suggest, well, just throw them in the back, throw them in the, in the you know, field behind the building, you know, because we don't care. But that's the first, that's the first step. Is it human? And, and most of the stuff I get is that question, okay? I have been called in to analyze all kinds of crazy things, dogs, deer, pigs, cow, horses, even birds recently. Um, but uh, I, I remember my wife and I about a year or so ago were looking at uh, houses with a realtor on a Saturday and got a call on the cell phone. Mark, we got the homicide crew out there. They set up the perimeter, the crime lab's there, and uh, uh, they're gathering all of their, their, you know, the evidence and everything, and we have a body wrapped up in a, in a, in a blanket uh, tied with twine, and uh, it's just, uh, can you get out here? I said, well, no, not really. Um, I answered to a higher authority, you know, honey, I can't, you know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I'll tell you what, bring it into the coroner's office and, uh, and I'll take a look at it when I, when I get there. So we got done doing what we were doing. They brought it back to the coroner's office and I got there and there was a pig tied up. Um, <laughs> the, the head had been removed, the feet, the hooves had been removed. Didn't look for the tail, but um, anyway. And some of the people on the scene suspected that they weren't looking at human, something human but nobody felt confident enough to, make, to be the one to make that call. And so, I, you know, it was pretty gross. Somebody, I don't know what somebody was doing, but you get these things sometimes, you know, um, where somebody hunted a pig, killed a pig or whatever, maybe it was a wild boar. And then, and then I got a call from a detective a week later. He said, okay, now, Mark, I'm writing my report. Um, so it's a pig, not a human. I said, it's a pig, not a human. Okay, now, what species was that? And I said... What species? Hmm. Well, first of all, I don't do pigs. I, I do primates, so I don't know what species. And second of all, isn't the fact that it's not human good enough? Yeah, yeah you're right. I think it probably is. Okay, they don't care if it's what species it is. Okay, so we can move on. Um, about three weeks ago, they all called in. Homicide sergeant called me up, said, can you go with me? They found a, a, a human skeleton in such and such a place. And I said, okay, yeah, well, here we go. So I got in the car with him, and it was, there, was, there, was a, there was a convoy. There's three of us. Uh, myself and one detective in one car, the sergeant in another car, and the, another car behind us, and we're all racing to the scene. And we get there, and the deputy's there in her patrol car guarding the scene. And, uh, and you know, we're thinking, okay, could be, could be Indian because this is kind of out in the middle of nowhere, so we're kind of planning our approach and everything. And so we get there, and everybody says, okay, Mark, it's up there. You go tell us, what, you know, what's going on. So I walk up there, and a little, up a little embankment, and about uh, 20 feet away, I see this deer skeleton laying on, in, on the ground. I said, folks, it's deer. We can, you know, oh, okay, all right. Well, cancel the crime lab. So we cancel the crime lab, but people don't know. And I looked at that, and it's very easy for me to say, come on, guys. But you know what? If you don't have training, if you don't have training, I mean, how do you know, I mean, that you're dealing with something human? Uh, where's my non-human bag? Oh, this is mine. Okay, well, well, I uh, hear... Uh, this is a this is a non-human hip bone, okay? And here is a human hip bone. It's got the same elements. It's got the same thing. It's got the acetabulum for the for the femur, little socket for the femur. It's got the blade and all that. It's just shaped differently. This is a quadrupedal animal. This is a bipedal animal. It's shaped differently. So it's tempting for me to kind of pass judgment, and say, "Come on, get with it." But you know what? If people don't have training in that kind of thing, they don't know. Um, this was uh, I was looking at a homicide case for. Uh, it's a cold case from 1998, and Lori and I were busting open the box and going through the stuff, and, and um, they got this in there, and this isn't even human. This isn't even part of the case. But what happens is when you find remains, and you find human remains or any remains, the first thing they'd say is, okay, get a perimeter, and everybody, let's scour the scene and collect everything you can collect. And 90% of the stuff usually happens to be totally irrelevant. So the ability to say this is important and this is not is, is important. Do you have a question? Um, all right, so the shape of the bone will reveal its function and the locomotion of its, uh, of its owner. My students um, learn this as, a, as the, the, the functional complex of the, 
of the animal? Is it, and how it gets around, the locomotion of the animal. Is it bipedal? Is it a quadruped? Is it live in the trees? Does it live on the ground? The shape of the bone, is it, is it, is it carrying a lot of weight? Is it meant for flexibility? All these things will make a big difference on the shape of the bone, okay? The other thing is, is it forensic? Okay, so once you've identified that it's human, then you've got to ask yourself, is it forensic, okay? In other words, should I care or can I go home and relax? This is what the detectives want to know. They want to know, okay, I had, <laughs> I had a, a, a situation where somebody found a skull and I got a call from the detective saying, okay, they found a skull and we want to know, this was on a Friday afternoon, like at 3 o'clock, we want to know, is it, is it forensic or is it like a Cro-Magnon? I said, I'm pretty sure it's not a 30,000-year-old Frenchman, but why don't you describe it to me? You know, I, I, first thing I said was, well, you can kind of tell an old bone by the way it feels. What does it feel like? Feel like? I'm not touching it. Okay. All right. Well, what does it smell like? Smell like? Are you insane? Okay. I'll be out there in 20 minutes. So I roll up, and, and, and there's a bunch of deputies, big burly guys with their big burly guns sitting behind the, 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 the trunk of the patrol car. And, I'm, and I walk up there, and they're like, it's in there. It's in there. I go, okay. It's in there. And so I open the box, and, and there's a skull. And, and yeah, that's human. That's an Asian male. Uh, probably 25 to 40 years old, and uh, it's forensic. Well, how can you tell? Well, you flip him over, and you give it a sniff, and eh, he's not done, okay? And you can feel the greasy kind of patina the, 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 of the de decomposition, uh, uh, the volatile fatty, fatty acids from decomposition that, that are still on there sometimes. But the thing with that is, after we got back to the office, the, that was just the, the deputies. The homicide people came in to me and they said, okay, are you sure, are you sure, are you sure? Well, yes, I'm sure. What's the big deal? I'm sure. No, but really, are you sure? What's the big deal? Well, what was the big deal? It was, you know, by that time it was like 4 o'clock on a Friday. And really, it would have been very convenient if we had a Cro-Magnon. But we didn't. So in this particular case here, um, I have a, mo a modern forensic case. Matter of fact, I have her. I think, I think she might be this one, yeah. Um, have her, uh, and that's my get to work, people. You find something like that, she's relatively, um, first of all, she doesn't have any traits of a Native American, an, an old um, uh, Paleo-Indian, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but the other thing is, you could tell she's relatively newly deceased, a few years or so. On the other hand, on the right there, I have Chill. Okay, that's an old, uh, that was dug up by uh, some freeway workers uh, who were digging a hole for a post. And, uh, and came up with a whole cache of bones, and uh, including the skull. Very, very old, very, very fractured, very broken, very dried out, plus had traits that told me we're talking about um, an, an Indian or Asian individual. And of course, Native Americans came from Asia originally, so you would expect that. Now, determining sex. By the way, sex and gender are not the same thing to an anthropologist, to a biological anthropologist. I tell my students that sex is your plumbing that you're born with. That's your plumbing. Gender is the, uh, the, the social roles that are appropriate for you based on your plumbing. In other words, uh, in a lot of times in the West, we have basically two genders, male and female. But other societies, it's not necessarily like that. Native American societies often at times have a third gender called burdash, uh, where males, uh, even though they're born with male plumbing, they uh, um, take on female roles, do female work, dress as females, socialize with the females, and so on and they're perfectly well accepted, and they're even esteemed because they s are seen as bridging the gap between maleness and femaleness. There's also female bird ash, right, so it goes both, goes both ways. All right, so anyway, if you're going to determine sex, the best part of the uh, skeleton for determining sex are, first of all, the hip bones. Why might that be? Children. Yeah, carrying children, giving birth, right? Mm -hmm. Giving birth to children, and so females tend to have uh, wider, what's called a, a wider subcubic angle. I'll show you a picture here in a second. Um, and a wider sciatic notch. Um, Lori and I, when we were going through, when we were going through this case, this is a female, and um, going through the box, and uh, it said John Doe on it, from 1998, and we're uh, the, we were going through and looking at the different um, bones that we had there, and pulled out a hip bone, and I said, well, this isn't a John Doe at all; it's a Jane Doe, and um, and the way I could tell was from the hip bones. I'll show you a, a picture here. Okay, we'll, we'll go into the skull in a second. Um, but don't rely on clothing and don't count ribs. Why, why do we not want to count the ribs to see if we have male or female? Ma males uh, have fewer ribs than females, right? 
No, it's the same. They have the same amount. Same amount. Same amount. Okay. So don't count the ribs. That won't help. Clothing won't help either because this particular female was wearing all male clothing when she was found. And that threw people off. And that threw me off because I started to doubt myself. I looked at the traits and I said, everything about this tells me female. And then I went to the police department and looked at the photos of the scene and looked at the clothing that had been left there. I thought, this is all male clothing. And I started to really doubt myself. But in the end, you've got to follow the science. And subsequently, I saw a report that another anthropologist did, and that person came up with female also. So I'm like, okay, all right, stop doubting the science. Yes? Do you have a question? No? Okay. Um, okay, so anyway, what we're talking about here with the pubic bone is this subpubic angle. Okay? This is wide for, uh, for childbirth. On the other hand, I have uh, here a male subpubic angle, and you see how narrow that is. That's not built for childbirth. Um, also, the, the sacrum, the lower part of the, of the vertebrae and the coccyx, the little tailbone, on males is curved in more, and on females it's, it's not as curved. And for females who do have a curved sacrum, uh, if you give, uh, when you give childbirth, if you give natural birth, sometimes they have to break that to, make, to allow the baby to, to get out. But the sciatic notch I mentioned before too, that's this little notch uh, next to the blade of the, of the hip bone. And if you, the rule of thumb is that if you put your thumb in there and it touches the side, you have a male. And if it's really wide and your thumb won't touch the side, you have a female. It's all about, it's all about the function of those bones, the function, uh, the characteristics of the, of the individual that has those bones. Female, human, uh, male humans, or you know, human beings have big brains. Females give birth to, to humans and need to be able to give birth to individual, individuals with big heads. Right? So you have a wider subcubic angle. That whole birth canal area is fashioned for that. On the very back, on the back of the pubic bone here, this is called the dorsal surface. Sometimes, in the course of natural childbirth, the ligaments and so on are going to pull on that, and it will actually take divots of bone out. Sounds pretty painful. I'm glad I don't have to give childbirth, right? But um, they'll actually take uh, divots out. That's called, uh, those are called scars of parturition or dorsal pitting. All that will tell you is this individual gave birth. Won't tell you how many times, okay? Um, but that's a very good point. That, and that's a clue to, to assessing identity. Um, the skull is another good place for uh, determining uh, sex. The skull in a male has what we call brow ridges, superorbital ridges, okay, bumps over the eyebrows. Um, also, a more squared chin. This is kind of hard to see here, but a more squared off uh, chin. Actually, that's my female, but the chin right there would be more squared off in a male. This is a male here. Um, and uh, as far as the, the lateral part of the skull, um, more robust on the back. This right here, the back of the skull, is the nuchal area. And uh, you feel the nuchal area it has a rough ridge there. That's called the nuchal ridge. And that's for big, thick neck muscles. Males tend to be more robust or muscular uh, than females. And so those neck muscles attach or articulate to the spinous, to, to the spinous processes, to the vertebrae. And they, they, you know, those are your neck muscles, your splenius capitis muscles. Um, and then also this little projection here is called a mastoid process. This is for sternoclinomastoid neck muscles is all you need to worry about. Neck muscles that come down and articulate with the, the sternum and the clavicles. And so bigger muscles in males is just a fact of life, right? My students, what do we call that when males are bigger than females? Sexual dimorphism, right? Sexual dimorphism exists. And so, um, and so those are certain things that you look for. Also, uh, I was telling Lori about this the other day, and she almost poked my eye out. But if you look at the, the lower part of the uh, orbit, the eye orbit, and you feel up there, in males, that's rather dull. In females, it's rather sharp. Now, don't poke your eye out. And if you can do it to your friend, tell them first. So, but the overall robusticity. Robusticity, though, has to do with muscle development, and you can't always tell sex by muscle development. Um, muscle is a living tissue, and or not muscle, well, muscle too, but bone is living tissue, and uh, it, uh, it reacts with the muscles, and it's used to anchor muscles. Uh, the insertion and origination points for a lot of muscles are in bone, and so as the muscle gets bigger, those attachment points have to get bigger too. 
And so uh, you, if you're female and you do a lot of heavy lifting or do a lot of um, uh, you know, work that takes a lot of uh, muscle, you're going to develop those things as much as a male. So you know, these are just clues to kind of give you, give you the direction to look in. Um, also, the size, of, this is kind of a funky way to do this, but the size of the humerus head and um, the, uh, and the head of the, of the femur, the l uh, upper leg bone, you can actually measure that, and studies have been done that tell you that if it's over a certain amount, um, then it's probably male. If it's under that, then it's probably female. I had to use this. I've, this is very, to me, I don't like using this. I like using the skull or the pubic bones, um, but uh, I've had to do this one time. You, the first picture I showed you, the, the body on the table there, they, they wouldn't let me, those spoil sports wouldn't let me try to take out the pelvic bones because they didn't want to make a mess. And so I said, well, okay, well, I'll look at the skull. The skull says male, but, you know, you always want to cross-check what you're doing. And so I thought, well, I'll take the guy's arm off and measure the thing. And so measure the, the head of the humerus. I shouldn't say thing. That's not terribly scientific. <laughs> um, measure the head of the humerus, and that told me male, too. But I would never go just off that. Determining age is very important. If you're going to round down who it is you're looking for, who this person might be, you want to give an, a range uh, of age. Well, it just so happens that the skeleton changes over time. And there are basically two types of changes that occur to the skeleton as people get older. There's uh, formative changes, changes that happen as you uh, go from childhood into adulthood. And then uh, degenerative changes, that kind of the changes of breaking down as you get older. Okay? So let's talk about some of these things. Okay? Formative changes. Uh, the adult uh, human has 206 bones, but a child has many more than that. That's because the, the bones grow in pieces. Uh, they grow in, you have your ends of the bone, and you have your, your shaft of the bone, and you have the parts in between. A bunch of fancy names for those things, we won't worry about that. But uh, they basically, they grow in pieces, and that's because the, in, the infant is growing, right? So you don't want to have a solid, already formed bone, it's got to grow. So you have cartilage holding those pieces together. As an individual gets older, those uh, pieces of bone are going to um, ossify, or the cartilage is going to ossify, and you're going to have a fully developed bone. I'm going to show you some examples of this. Okay? So as the individual grows, the pieces will grow together. And the amount of progress has been studied uh, through lots of different populations in a lot of different places, a lot of different contexts, to see just about what, at what period of, of age, what point of life, uh, this particular bone will become completely developed, or that bone. And so lots of studies have been done. In my lab class that I teach elsewhere, we talk about how to determine age by looking at that type of thing. Okay? Tooth eruption also helps. Um, that can help, obviously, give pretty good age. But once you're an adult, you're an adult with a tooth eruption. Uh, here's an example. Okay? So oftentimes I'm met with, you know, you know, they call me in and there's, I get a big glad bag and then next to the glad bag a bunch of little bags. And they say, what do we do? What is it? And so here's me. This is a picture of uh, one particular case. It's this one. I can't talk too much about it because it hasn't gone to trial yet. But basically, I'm in the process at this point on the picture on the right of putting it in anatomical order. Still not done yet. The clavicles shouldn't be down by the feet, and the ribs don't belong down in the legs and so on. But working on putting it in order. But this is a very good example of determining age by the growth of the bones. Because as I looked at this individual, I noticed, and here's another side, here's another shot of that, looking from the, the skull down. If you look at um, the arm bones, okay, where, those, where my lines are, um, those, those little balls there that are sitting there, that's actually the head of the humerus. That's actually this right here. That individual had not developed yet. He was still an adolescent. And when he, when he died and decomposed, that ball or the head of the humerus fell off. Because the only thing holding it to the rest of the bone is cartilage, which decomposes pretty readily. Okay? Here's an example from, from the same case. I was looking, uh, I was going over the bones, and I, um, I picked up uh, this little teeny disc of a bone. And I thought, oh, there's the head of the radius. And the pathologist assistant came to me and said, oh, what is that? I said, well, it's the head of the radius. There's the radius. It's a lower arm bone, and there's the little head right there. It goes right on top. This individual... Uh, th this bone will fully fuse by about 15 years old. So we have an individual who's not yet 15. But she didn't know what it was because they're not used to seeing bones. They're not used to it. So I was able to tell them that you have an individual who's not yet 15, 
based on that, and of course, other parts of the skeleton too. Degenerative changes, as the adult ages, the skeleton starts to show signs of wear, okay? Uh, these signs are particularly apparent in certain parts of the, of the body. The vertebrae, you start to get osteophytosis, arthritis, you start to get bony projections on the, on the vertebrae. Um, that will give an indication that the person's been around a while or, and or has done some pretty hard work that required a lot of labor on the back. Ribs, the end ribs will change over time. They'll get rougher over time. They'll start to uh, look more, uh, well, it's kind of hard to explain, but they, they start to change over time. They become less smooth and more rough, more sharp, and more almost brittle. Pubic bones, I have a picture of the uh, pubic bone on the skull. Here is a picture of a pubic symphysis, and a lot of studies have been done to um, look at the pubic symphysis. Let's see if this one has one. Nope, he's not full yet. Anyway, stud studies have been done on the pubic symphysis. That's this face right here to see what happens to that as you get older. And it turns out that when you start off as a younger individual, it's billowy and it's kind of puffed out and it's not very well defined on the margins. But as you get older, the billows start to go away. It starts to get smooth, flat, sharper on the edges. And then as you get older and older, it starts to actually get dished in. It starts to actually dished in. Here's an individual. Uh, this actually is the pubic bone from this person right here, the pubic symphysis. And you can see where the face of that symphysis looks dished in. It's not billowy. I mean, I know this, a lot of the stuff is very subjective, and it takes a lot of experience to see these things. But that basically told me that you have a person that's at least in their mid-30s, uh, maybe, even, maybe even older, probably even into the 40s or so. Okay. That's a degenerative change. Also, skull sutures, if, you, if all you have is a skull, skull sutures are pretty good for determining age because the sutures are those lines in the skull that hold the different bones of the skull together. Your skull is not one, it's not one big bone, okay? Because the brain has to grow, the individual has to grow. So it's lots of bones uh, held together by these lines, these sutures with the small bits of cartilage in between. And as the individual gets older, these sutures will start to disappear. Let's see if I have one that's disappearing. Maybe not. <coughs> yeah, kind of. Okay, here's the uh, here's a coronal suture of this uh, this individual here, and you can see toward the ends, it's starting to it's starting to disappear. You can't see it very well. That's going to happen as you get into adulthood, later adulthood, uh, 40s um, on up is when that's going to begin to happen. So if all I have is a, is a skull, and and I can look at the sutures, that'll give me an idea. But the problem is, you know, it doesn't, it's not as exact as using those formative changes, okay? Um, okay, moving along. So I look for the presence of those. This individual right here is not even into his 30s yet probably because of the presence of those sutures, and especially that one down there, the farther down one on the, the temporal bone. There's a big suture there still. It hasn't even started to close, okay? Biological ancestry. Homo sapiens is a polytypic species. In my class, you guys, we're going to talk about this toward the end. But polytypic means varying with regard to the expression of one or more traits. Okay, and what are some examples of traits that human beings variably express? What's an example of a trait? That some populations will express one way and others will express another. Nose. What is it? Nose. A nose, the shape of the nose, right? That's called prognathism. Very important, yep. Um, what else? Okay, the shape of the skull, perhaps. Skin color, what about skin color? Hair, hair form, eye shape, yeah. Um, these things uh, indicate, are good indicator, indicators, of biological ancestry. Um, some people, not anthropologists, take these traits and lump people into groups called races. So if you have this package of traits, then you're this race, and if you have that package of traits, then you're that race. Um, we don't quite buy that, but we do admit that uh, different populations from different parts of the world will express certain traits uh, differently than other populations. For example, skin color tends to be darkest near the equator, right, in, in tropical areas. It's just a fact. And it, that the selection for skin color uh, starts to um, be reduced as you move away from the equator. And of course, the selection for lighter skin gets increased as you get farther from the equator, too. And that's a whole other another discussion. But 
uh, natural selection and other, other of the forces of evolution have worked on these things. And so, yes, you can look at, a, at an individual, look at traits, and say they probably came from this particular um, uh, group of, of people. Um, there are basically two categories of traits that forensic anthropologists analyze, metric and non-metric. Metric are traits that you put a number on, you measure it. Um, it's been found out that when you look at a skull, a skull is pretty good for determining race, but th there was a study done with anthropologists and, and they said, okay, well let's have anthropologists come in and look at the skull, look at the skulls, we have a bunch of skulls, and tell us just by looking, not by measuring, what, um, what the ancestry of these individuals are. Turns out they had a very low success rate of doing that. But, however, when they actually did the dozens of measurements required to, to, you know, to take of the skull and see where an individual might have come from, what race they came from, then they were much more successful. So lots of different measurements have done, lots of metric type of traits have been looked at to determine the frequency of certain traits in certain populations. Non-metric traits cannot be measured, okay, they're either present or they're absent. Okay, so by far, the best part of the skeleton for trying to find biological ancestry is the skull. Okay? You're going to see lots of different um, types of traits uh, to look at, and there's really, this is a huge discussion, but the, the nasal aperture, the width of the nasal aperture, uh, the height of the na nasal aperture, uh, the projection of the, of the, uh, the cheekbones, or zygoma. Okay? People of Asian ancestry tend to have orthognathic faces or flatter faces, and so the cheekbones protect, project forward. Um, people of uh, African ancestry tend to have a much wider nose with what's called nasal guttering, these little shoveled out um, parts, lower margins of the, of the nasal aperture. Um, also, they tend to have receding uh, cheekbones. Right, and in the shape of the nasals too, they tend to have a kind of a uh, convex shape to the nasal. Tend to. Now, but one of the reasons that anthropologists don't get too excited about race is because of exactly what you're saying, gene flow. Okay, we are, don't have three, four, five, six, whatever distinct races, where only whites can mate with whites and blacks with blacks, and so on. So it doesn't work that way. We know it doesn't work that way, and I and I already knew it worked that worked that way. It didn't work that way, but. I got this skull because uh, I wanted to get a nice demonstration of an Asian skull. And so I ordered it, and, uh, and, and it's just a cast, it's not the real thing. But they said, look, it's got even got this special suture here called a metopic suture. That's an Asian trait. Um, it's got the shovels, shoveled out incisors, scooped out incisors. That's an Asian trait. It's got nice, lots of fun Asian traits, even the projecting uh, cheekbones. And um, the Indian hook and everything. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, I got it, and I was very, very disappointed. Yeah, it's got Asian traits, but it's also got some, some African traits too. Like you say, the, the prognathism. You don't see that very much in Asians. This is a mixed race individual. But it also is an object lesson. You can't take people and put them in one box. We are a continuum of variation. We're not three or four, five, six different types. We don't have types, we have continuums. Um, here's an example of a, of a metric trait, measuring the height and the width of the nose. Okay, a wider nose, African, middle type nose, Asian, narrower nose um, would be uh, Caucasian. And that has everything to do with nat the nature, right? Natural selection, okay? And then a non-metric trait is a tra trait that is either there or not there. These extra little bones called Wormian bones in the back of the skull, in this case they're over here. This indiv individual doesn't have them, but this one does. Tells me that the person is probably of Asian ancestry. This happened to be a Native American skull that washed up in the Delta. Okay? And we've already talked about this. Races are not discrete categories. Stature. Stature is very easy. You do some measurements of bones, and you apply it to a formula, and you get a range of stature. That's, that's a mathematical thing. It's not fun, but it's not hard either. Okay, trauma. Here's the thing. Trauma is very important because you could get somebody, somebody could get sent to jail or prison based on what you say is there. So we have to be pretty sure. So anthropologists look for things on the bone like uh, blunt force trauma, something somebody hit with something blunt, sharp force trauma, knife wounds, uh, defensive wounds, especially what we call perifractures. If the uh, lower arm bones are broken, uh, the, the ulna and the radius, uh, you know, that's usually someone going, ah, don't hit me, kind of a thing. Dismemberment or a combination, okay, bullet wounds also. This poor guy, okay, that hole right there, not supposed to be there, shouldn't be there. 
This guy was found in uh, Tilden Park back in 1982 and uh, shot in the back of the head and dismembered. This dismemberment evidence came from the top of his femurs, which uh, his upper leg bones, which were carved out from the rest of the body. I don't have the femur with me. It went for DNA. But um, so he was shot in and dismembered. Okay, then we're almost to the end there. Forensic facial reconstruction. Okay, so this is kind of a way to find that phenotype. And this goes with empirical evidence, you know, uh, the tissue, the thickness of tissue in the faces for different, uh, um, different populations and so on. All that data is used to try to determine how to put a face on a skull. And so you start off with your skull, and this actually is this guy here, our guy that was shot in the back of the head. So you start off with him, and you put my, my markers on there to determine about how thick each of the, uh, the, the skin at the, each of the locations is going to be. And I start to put together the, uh, the clay on there, and I end up with the individual. A lot of this is subjective. How do you do the hair, you know, how do you do the ears, things like that. Well, you just stick with what is common. You don't want to go too extreme in one way or the other. The beautiful thing about this, to me, forensic facial reconstruction is great testimony to the scientific method because I am not an artist. I went to the University of Oklahoma to learn how to do this, and I was the only anthropologist there. Everybody else was artists. Their busts looked fantastic. They all had the same skull. It was a different one, but they all had the same skull. They looked fantastic. They had nice hair, and they did all kinds of great things with it. I'm not an artist, but you know what? My face looked a lot like theirs because I just followed the science, just followed the science. So this is a way to tell. You know, this individual here, one anthropologist said Asian female. I say not Asian because the cheekbones aren't quite forward enough for me. So I'm going to reconstruct her skull here in the next few weeks and, uh, and see what happens, see what she looks like, and try to get her identified. She's still not identified. Okay? So in the end, why do we do all this yucky, gross work? Okay? Well, here's an example of, I don't have him anymore, but here's an example. Okay? Guy shot, buried in the backyard. You can see the hole right there. Guy standing in a hole, digging out for the body. Underneath there, there's two pictures. Okay? That's the family. That's the family who was missing their son, their brother, for two years. It's not pleasant work necessarily for most people. It's kind of ucky, right? Kind of smelly, whatever, gross. It's also very, very necessary. We live in a society where justice is valued, okay? And, and people want answers and they want to know where their loved ones are. 